Beth Keen, and I'm CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. Um, welcome to the U.S. premiere of Sweet Home Sweet, a story of survival, memory, and returns. Last summer, Jordana Gessler, who's our museum's VP of Education and Exhibits, actually saw this particular exhibit when she was in Krakow and said, this is something, this is such an important story, we need to bring it here to LA, to our museum. So thank you to the Galicia Jewish Museum and to our special guest today, Michelle Oris, whose father took the photographs that you will see shortly after this. Um, Jacob Nowakowski, who's the director of the Galicia Jewish Museum. Um, Tomas Strug, who is the chief curator of the Galicia Jewish Museum. Um, and they, they are both here visiting from Poland. Um, and I also wanted to give a shout out to Jordana Gessler and Christy Jovanovic, who um, helped curate this exhibit and worked very closely with the Galicia Museum. And um, we're very excited for everyone to check it out um, after this program. So in addition to the photographs, artifacts, and interviews provided by the Galicia Museum and Oris family, we're proud to include objects from our museum's own collections, as well as those on loan from the Margaret Herrick Library at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Yale University's Fortunoff Archive, the Anu Museum at Tel Aviv University, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I also wanted to uh, thank Talby Philanthropies. I think Shana Penn is supposed to be, is Shana here? I don't see her yet, okay. Um, well, thank you, they're, they're our main sponsor for the exhibit today, so we are truly grateful for that. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the members of the Oris family who are with us today. If you guys want to raise your hand, um, thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the Consul General of Poland, Marta Walenska. Um, welcome. And if you haven't met her yet, please try to meet her after the program. She's, she's brand new to LA and we're so excited to have her here and she's already been a terrific partner with us. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge any survivors who we have with us today. I don't see anyone, and I did see a couple of board members. If you guys can, Paulette, raise your hand. Thank you for being here today. Um, so as a culturally specific museum, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Tonga people. So we pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and honor their continuing connection to this place. For those who are new to Holocaust Museum LA, we are the first survivor founded and the oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States. Uh, we are home to the West Coast's largest collection of Holocaust era artifacts and admission is free for all students and youth for 17 and under. Since day one, our mission has been grounded in teaching the critical lessons and social relevance of the Holocaust, empowering students and visitors to speak out and stand up against all forms of hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism. If you've never been to the museum before, we hope you'll come back and check out our artifact-rich galleries. Come back anytime and, and feel free to reach out to me. We'd be happy to give you a private tour. Uh, as you guys know, our work remi remains more vital than ever. Um, with the recent ADL uh, report that came out, anti-Semitism has reached its highest levels since they started tracking um, in them in 1979. Um, and every day you'll see yellow school buses lined up outside our museum. It's so important to educate young people because we know education is the best antidote to hate. Um, and we know that through our student tours and every student gets to meet a Holocaust survivor, we are truly changing student behaviors. 96% of our students who come think that uh, every young person needs to learn about the Holocaust in order to understand where prejudice and racism can lead. Last year, we welcomed over 27,000 students for tours um, and 80% came from Title I schools. 
we, in addition to providing free admission, we also pay for the buses for the f Title I schools. And for most students from these low-income communities, sometimes a visit to our Holocaust Museum is the only field trip that they will experience while they're in high school. Since opening our permanent home in 2010, we have welcomed nearly 600,000 visitors. And to meet the need and the demand for Holocaust education, we launched our Building Truth expansion plan a couple of years ago to double the museum's footprint. So we're really excited. We're going to be breaking ground sometime this summer, July, August, uh, to build the new Jonah Goldrich campus. Um, we're really excited about that. And you know it's so important to really amplify our um, reach and impact. And we'll be able to do that through this expansion project. Um, now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Jordana Gessler, our VP of Education and Exhibits. Thank you everyone for coming. As you heard, about 10 months ago, I was visiting Poland and went into the Galicia Jewish Museum, saw this exhibit, Sweet Home Sweet, and I turned to Kuba and I said, is this traveling? And he was like, it could. And so it's such an honor and privilege to have it here hosted at Holocaust Museum LA. It really, truly resonated with me. My own grandfather was a Polish Holocaust survivor, and he also returned to Poland um, time and time again for business and had a deep connection with it. And so I saw a lot of my own family's story in this exhibition, and I believe that it was truly a story that would resonate with many different people and thought that it would be perfect for the community here in Los Angeles. So I want to give us a minute to learn a little bit from our panelists, and then we'll definitely have an opportunity to go into the museum and see the incredible exhibition, see these photographs. It was really miraculous to be holding a photograph in my hand and thinking that this had been buried in the grounds at Plashov, that this had been developed during the Holocaust, that this had been taken by someone who really had an optimism that he would survive and he would be able to share the photographs. And to, to hold it in my hand, which was gloved, of course, just so we're all clear, and to, to think like what this photograph had been through and if this photograph could speak, what would it tell us? And so we'll all have that opportunity to hear what the photos are telling us. Um, first, I wanted to ask our panelists a few questions. I'm going to start with you, Michelle, so I hope you're ready. Um, and really thinking about the fact that we live in a time where firsthand accounts of the Holocaust are fading. My own grandfather passed away over 10 years ago. But transmission of what occurred during the Holocaust and how it affected second and third generation and even those who've loved and known Holocaust survivors continues. Holocaust survivors' experiences were transmitted not always through words, but through actions, practices, and values. Michelle, can you share a bit about what it was like to have two parents who survived the Holocaust and how did their experiences become known to you? Okay. Um. I'm going to answer that in a second, but first I'm going to, uh, Shana, there was a shout out to you to thank the Talby Foundation for supporting the exhibit, so I'm repeating best thank you. Um, I want to thank Jordana for bringing the exhibit. She saw the exhibit 10 months ago in Krakow, and now it's here and set up in LA. That's quite extraordinary, so thank you to Jordana. Thank you to Christy, who can't be with, Christy, who can't be with, her, with us today, who was amazing in putting this together with Kuba and Tomek. Thank you to Kuba and Tomek, who, uh, who was the director of the Galicia Jewish Museum, where the exhibit was um, initially. Uh, it ended in September of 2022. So it was there for about a year, a little over a year. Um, and I want to thank Eli Radovsky. I don't see him here, but I, Oren Radovsky did the films for us and all the video and videotaped everyone. I also want to thank um, my stepmother, Linda Orris, my half-sisters, uh, Jessica and Nina Orris, and my half-brother, Anders, um, for being here with us, my sister, Pauline, her husband, Michael, and my husband, Chip. Um, now I'll answer your question. Um, what was it like? So it's, it's almost um, sort of hard to explain. My mother's also a Holocaust survivor from Eastern Poland, and you just knew um, there were subtle um, ways you lived your life and how the food you ate. You ate pierogies, you ate pickle sandwiches, you, my father made tripe. Um, things that other American children didn't eat. They were eating 
peanut butter and jelly and bologna sandwiches at school, and I'd show up with a pickle sandwich. The, the clothing we wore until we were old enough to go buy Lee jeans at around ten, you know, 11, 12, were all European clothing. We looked very different. We also had parents that had accents, um, thick accents, particularly my father. I don't know that his syntax ever quite made it. <laughs> his English was not perfect. And um, they were also professionals. They were both physicians. So there were a lot of uh, odd signs that we stood out in a lot of ways. Um, my grandparents survived. Uh, Richard's parents did not survive. He was the only survivor except an uncle survived, Max Gartenberg, who moved to Montreal. Otherwise, that was it from his entire family. On my mother's side, she survived just with her parents. So from my m mother's parents, my grandparents, and my father, they spoke about the Holocaust. My father would tell us stories, just sort of little anecdotes, often very quirky. Um, but in a different land during a different time. And um, so you just knew you were different. Um, and then as time went on, as you get older, you start to learn about the Holocaust. And I actually became quite obsessed with the story of the Holocaust by about age 12 or 13, and spent a tremendous amount of time with my grandparents and with my father, asking lots of questions, making family trees. Um, that's really how it resonated. And then that just kept going. Taking us a little bit back to Krakow, which is where Richard was born, your father. Kuba, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about how you grew up in the historic Jewish district in, in Krakow, and as did your family generations before you. What inspired you to first research the history of it? What were you looking to uncover, and how have you navigated that in the last few decades um, to further educate people? And, and why is building relationships between Polish Jews, Polish Catholics, American Jews, Polish Jews in America, why is that so important for you? Thank you. Um, and again, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, with, with Michelle, uh, with Beth, with, with Shayna, with Jordana. It's, it's an honor for us and we're very, very excited that this exhibition starts, starts here and we hope it will be traveling in other places across the U.S. Um, as for the question, you know, uh, Richard uh, left Poland uh, at some point and although he was returning, uh, he left behind the void. I mean, his new life started somewhere else. Uh, and that was true for most of the Holocaust survivors. Of course, survivors constituted around 10% of the pre-war number of the Polish Jews. So uh, from 3.5 million people that lived, Polish Jews that lived in Poland uh, pre-1939, 90%, nine, nine out of 10, were killed. So what uh, they left behind was a void, an emptiness, uh, which was then filled uh, right away. Uh, by uh, the non-Jews, by the Poles, by Catholics, by their neighbors. Um, and, and we've been living, filling this void for decades. Um, the only thing was that um, we chose, choose not to remember. We choose not to discuss. We choose not to honor uh, the people that have been living uh, in all those places be before us. Um, and those things started to change only after Poland regained independence or democratic uh, became a democratic country. This is uh, in the 1990s, uh, where when suddenly we started to realize that we were living in these post-Jewish spaces. Uh, that before us, in many of those places that we considered always to be our own, that before us there were other people. Um, and, and that was also a story for me. I mean, I've been living in this, in this former Jewish district of Krakow actually for generations. So we were the ones that were there when Richard and his family were, were, were there. We might have been neighbors. Um, but yes, when I was born in 1983, none of this story of the pre-war Jewish life would be considered of any importance for my family that had been there for, for decades. Our lives would be in many ways separate um, from each other. Um, so yes, at some point you're, you're discovering that big part of, of your cuisine actually uh, is, is a cuisine that comes from the Jews that have been living there. You're discovering that part of your language uh, uh, comes from Hebrew or, or Yiddish. Um, one, of the, one of those stories that I often say is that actually I, until I was a teenager, um, I was convinced that like a proper Polish word for a stove in, in, a, in, a, in a kitchen uh, was Shabashnik, Shabbos oven, because this is how my mom, my Catholic mom, would call Shabbos oven in our house. She would always says dinner is at Shabashnik. So there were those little things, the crumbles of the past that were somehow 
that somehow survived. The only thing where it was that we had no idea where those objects, where those words, where those customs, where those uh, gefilte fish, Jewish style fish, where does it come from? And again, things changed in 1990s and that it was a nationwide kind of process of waking up. Uh, and that was also true for me. I discovered and started to be interested in the past, in the past of my hometown, of my neighborhood. Um, and that led me to ask, to start asking questions. Um, that led me to Galicia Jewish Museum. And uh, you know, many of those questions I keep asking. Um, but I think that's what, what it is all about. Um, is it the answer? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and I, I really want to sort of look at that void that you mentioned, the fact that there was a void, the fact that before the Holocaust, 10% of the Polish community identified as Jewish. And in cities like Warsaw or Łódź, it was 30% of the city. I think Krakow was 25% was identified as Jewish. And now it's a very small population in Poland. I think 0.01% of the Polish population is Jewish. And so, Tomak, when you were curating this exhibit, when you were first looking at it to bring to a Polish audience, how did you curate for that void? What did you want um, Polish visitors to leave with knowing? Uh, good afternoon. Firstly, thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, here with you. Michelle mentioned many many names um, of the family members. Uh, I should mention Michelle as, a, as a one of those uh, um, persons who were involved in creating this exhibition, but also the exhibition is about her, uh, about her experience um, with this story and about um, her, her son, her sons. Uh, how do you navigate uh, the gaping void of Jews not living in Poland anymore or almost non living in Poland anymore? Uh, I, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's, it's by trying to escape these numbers that you quoted, uh, and by trying to find a balance between everything what was the Holocaust and everything that was not the Holocaust. Um, these numbers are shocking and true, and 10% of the pop population of Poland before the war vanished. 25% uh, of um, Kraków's um, population Roughly 60,000 uh, in 250,000 um, people city were uh, Jewish. Uh, in some places in Poland, in some uh, smaller towns, in some villages uh, on the eastern border, it sometimes was 90, 70, 80 percent of the Jewish population. In those smaller places, very often, very often, uh, those communities were murdered within one afternoon or a couple of hours. Um, and gone, gone. The hundreds of years of um, of history. So of course you cannot escape these numbers. But I think that because you cannot escape, then you 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 have to try to escape them. Because you know, twenty five five percent of uh, Krakow's population was uh, was 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 Jewish. You know, Krakow is not that bad because we have uh, Jewish heritage, because we have Jewish life. Myself being involved in in in, in Jewish Jewish uh, creating Jewish Jewish culture in Krakow from years now, it was very difficult. It was very difficult for me. It's still very difficult for me to imagine what was it like every fourth person to be Jewish. What was what was uh, mm, mm, what that m meant for 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 Krakow? And only only recently, actually, this is this is a side note. But only recently, I was able maybe comprehend that. Uh, because of the waves of Ukrainian refugees coming to Krakow, and at some point we had roughly 200,000 uh, or 180,000 uh, Ukrainian refugees in Krakow, and you can uh, see them on the streets, you see, see them in the bus, you see them in the line, waiting, waiting in the line, at the doctor's office, everywhere, everywhere. Uh, you hear the language, you know that they are Ukrainians in Krakow, and you can start to imagine that Every fourth per Jewish person in Krakow meant that there was language, there was culture, there was presence, there was everything. There was everything that was taken away from us, from Krakowians. So this is very important for us to navigate, mm, navigate this uh, mm, this void and finding this balance. Because Holocaust was six years, uh, the Jewish uh, history in, in Krakow was eight hundred years. So how 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 you weigh those two? Uh, those two, those two, those two, um, those two numbers, and uh, trying to find this balance 
there's many ways for, to do it, but we, fi we, we found that one of the ways to do it is to tell personal stories. And this exhibition is doing exactly that, it's telling personal story. Because with 60,000 Jews in Krakow before the war, you can maybe estimate that there was 20,000 Jewish family. If you will tell the story of one Jewish family, uh, and you see how complex this story is, how complicated it is, and how relevant it is today, you know, eight years later for Poles, for New Yorkers, for people in Los Angeles, you can again go back to the numbers and try to multiply this complicity by 20,000 Jewish mm, families, but infinite number of Jewish families um, uh, living um, uh, in Poland before um, b b before the war. So really, you know, navigating this void is impossible uh, and it's necessary. And it's telling the stories of uh, which are relevant for us today. Thank you. And I know that your background is in photography or curate and working with photography archives. And so I'm wondering if you can also speak a bit to how you approached this collection of photographs. How was it different from other collections that you've worked with? And what was it because of the history? Was it because of the story? And, and how it sort of resonated with you? Um. Y yes, so short answer would be yes, we approach it differently. Uh, I will start with the last part of your question. Um, we approach it differently because of the story of this collection. Uh, but in fact, there are two stories. There are two stories in this collection. First story of this collection is how the photographs, what you said, opening this, uh, this panel, how the photographs were um, saved at a great personal risk by Richard Ores. Uh, how he uh, took them with him to the ghetto, later took uh, them with him to the uh, concentration camp of, of Płaszów, which is Kraków's hometown concentration camp, um, mm, the famous camp depicted by the, by the, by the Schindler's, um, Schindler's List, and later managed to find a way to hit them, to, to put them into glass jar, and the most remarkable story is that he was able to get back there and uh, retrieve them and and this is a story which on its own uh, with the collection of photographs is, is is worth worth telling you know it's a story that hollywood can can utilize and make a beautiful um, heartbreaking movie um, 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 about but there is another story because this story is amazing but it's not unique not unique in a way that almost every collection um, and i'm not m talking about individual collection i'm talking about um, about personal collection or family collection, which is connected with the Holocaust, has such a story. If you will take photographs of Henry Gross from Łódź Ghetto, uh, he also took the photographs at very own personal risk, hid them in the very same way, and he, he, he retrieved them um, after the war. If you will take any other um, mm, set of photographs, I don't know, uh, the, the one of the co collections we work with were, were photographs of Zeva Aleksandro Aleksandrovich, a pre-war Krakowian photographer who was also uh, 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 traveling the world because he was from a very wealthy, assimilated family. He was in he was in LA, he was taking photographs in LA actually. FBI was, was, uh, was thinking that he's spying uh, um, being, being in States, but he did a number of photographs in Krakow, pre-war, uh, pre 1930s, uh, which are like a sort of a benchmark of the depicting of the Jewish life in Krakow next to Wisniak and such alikes. Uh, and there is a story also because he emigrated to Palestine, he put all those 20,000 photographs into a suitcase, put it somewhere in the you know attic and forgot about that. It was only after he died that his grandson retrieved the photographs. So there's always a story. Richard's, uh, Richard's story is amazing, Mm, uh, there's a connection with the with Krakow in the, in the, in the story. Uh, nevertheless, those stories are there because most of the heritage, material heritage, not only Jewish communities but photographs, documents, uh, artworks, furnitures, you name it, were destroyed for a for a set of photographs taken in Krakow before the war by Jews. Uh, some of them taken in ghetto to survive. You needed a miracle, and this was this um, this miracle. The story which really changed our approach was. What happened with these photographs after the um, after the war? Because uh, Richard r retrieved them and he took uh, took them with them uh, with with him, uh, starting with with uh, Switzerland uh, and then to U.S. And this became a part of family photography collection. He was adding to this collection. This was shocking for us that you could 
you can put a photograph taken in the Krakow ghetto next to a photograph taken in New Jersey uh, in the backyard of someone's house and this is the same story, this is the same family. This is partly because um, the photographs that Richard saved and um, uh, there are pre-war family photographs but there are also photographs which he and his friends took within the Krakow ghetto which is uh, amazing uh, on its own but how how they did these photographs is that you will not see a violence there, you will not see uh, a single German there, you won't see, you won't see a gun there. I, if you didn't know, this is like a bunch of um, gang of friends, how we call them in the, uh, in, the in the museum. Uh, they knew each other before the war, they knew each other in, in the ghetto, they were trying to live the best life they could in the circumstances. Um, there, there was uh, really those photographs this is just few few sessions because if you look at them carefully you'll see that this was one or two or three afternoons that they somehow put their hands on the camera but wh where I'm going with it, with it is that it was shocking for me that you can put a photograph taken in 1933 in Krakow next to a photograph taken in 1968 uh, or seven or six um, mm, and it's the same story, the, sa this, the same story. So what we did based on that is that we completely uh, um, abandoned the, the most obvious idea of making an exhibition about these photographs. We should be show these photographs, make several blow ups, uh, uh, write a uh, 120 words uh, introductory text about Richard Ores uh, was a Krakowian Jew who hid the photographs in the Płaszów camp and he retrieved them after the war. Add few, 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 few comments, that's that. Yeah done. It will be beautiful exhibition. It will be exhibition worth, worthy of making. Uh, but we only made a, a sort of a first section out of this. Uh, we decided that if this, this collection really also contains the photographs taken in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, 70s, trips to Krakow, trips to Poland, trips to uh, all, over, all, all over Europe, we should tell the story of this family because this family, Richard was gone at that point, um, because this family is uh, 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 is coming here. This family is talking to us. Um, we can talk to this family. Uh, uh, this is a story we should um, we should tell. There is no uh, to give you the, the, the one one example of how we how we uh, how how we um, did it is there's no uh, it's not a coincidence that we use the photograph as an opening for uh, fo um, photograph of this exhibition, which is not the Holocaust photograph, which is which is not the ghetto photograph. It's a photograph of Michelle uh, and her siblings. Uh, at the Market Square in 1967. Uh, uh, if you didn't know the story, there's no chance in the world that you will uh, guess that this guy survived the Holocaust, survived the ghetto, is living in US and is willingly bringing his kids to um, um, to Poland. And and yeah, that was the story. Um, that was the story to tell. Thank you. And also, that's a very iconic photograph. I know I have it of my own grandparents from the 60s. And then, of course, I have photos of myself in that same square. I feel like it's quintessential Krakow to take a photo in that square. So thank you so much. I, I have the photo, the same photo from the 1980s. So yeah, it's like, yeah, with the pigeons around me and, you know. You can't visit Krakow and not go there. Um, I, I want to bring it back to Cuba just for one second. I know that you are currently the, the director of the Galicia Jewish Museum. And I believe you started there maybe as a volunteer or just sort of piquing your interest and you've really grown with the institution and the institution has grown with you. So the Galicia Jewish Museum, for those of you who have not been there before, it is in Krakow and it does commemorate the Holocaust, but I think it's also about a celebration of Galicia Jewish history and offering a look at Polish Jewish history from a new and different perspective. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the museum for maybe those of us who have not visited or had the chance yet to go, and also how Sweet Home Sweet fit into the mission and vision of the institution. Yes, thank you. Um, so, so, so Galicia Jewish Museum is, is um, a different kind of a museum. I mean, we're not a Holocaust memorial. Uh, unlike here, uh, unlike other um, Holocaust uh, memorials, the Galicia Jewish Museum from very beginning was created to, to discuss the past in context of the present day. So uh, what, what Tomek mentioned, um, the way how we approach the, 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 this collection was not really new for us. Uh, in many projects that we've been uh, doing, we look uh, and try to in, uh, and are interested or try to understand how does those objects, whether these are photographs or drawings, how they affect us today, in what way they are relevant to us today. 
Um, so this exhibition was important for us because we wanted to understand what it is that brings people like Michelle, like her family, to Poland. What it is that you are looking for when you are coming to the old land, whether it's Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, you name it. Why are you looking for, for memories, for tangible objects? Are you looking for answers? Uh, are you coming in to ask questions uh, or just to be silent? Uh, we've been trying to understand, and that was because of this constant relation, unbroken relation that r started with Richard and then continued throughout different generations. Um, we thought that this is an excellent example to try to understand what it is that the, 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 the descendants of the Holocaust survivors feels about, again, the old land, because what we're talking is Poland or Krakow, but it's true more or less for other places. So we, that was, was one of the goals, uh, try to explain. And of course, within the family, the, 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 Orin, the, the Ores Shorin family, there are different responses. Some of the members are, are interested in Poland. Uh, uh, um, Richard's grandson, Adam, been living in Poland for, for a number of years. He spends half of the time in, 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 in Warsaw. Before moving to Warsaw, he was actually in Krakow. He was living in for a couple of years in Krakow, and actually he left Krakow for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons was that in Krakow he felt we would often or almost always define him through the story of his grandfather. We would ask him constantly the same things to do. Adam, could you make a guided tour of Richard Ores Krakow? Could you tell us about whatever? And at some point he responded, listen, I want to have my own story, my own relation with this country. And he left the war so. Um, not, uh, so far. not so far, but um, anyhow, so, so th th that was one of the things that we were trying to answer just beyond telling the story of Richard and, 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 and his collection. But that we were also we were interested in the reversal of the same question. We wanted to show to Poles what it is. Again, w to explain to the Polish visitors, the Galicia Jewish Museum 2019 pre-COVID had around 70,000 visitors, 40% of them Poles. And then COVID happened, and now the numbers are, are back more or less to, to the pre-COVID uh, levels. We wanted to explain to the Poles precisely the same thing. What it is that brings Jews and descendants of the Polish Jews to Poland? What it is that they are looking for? Because if you open uh, a Polish newspaper, especially the right-wing newspapers, you will find a very simple answer, that they are all coming after properties and, 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 and money. Um, while, you know, in, in reality, m most of those Polish Jews have been living in a very small uh, shtetl kind of like uh, environments, there is nothing left. And it's uh, not uh, entirely about uh, those things. It's about something different, something far less tangible than, than a place. Um, so we've been trying to explain this also to the Poles, what it is, why Poland is so important for the Jews. Um, and I think we've succeeded. I think we've succeeded again. The exhibition has been extremely popular uh, mm, uh, among the Poles. Um, and that's kind of what we try to do because we understand that the past is still very much influencing our present day relations. So if we want to improve the present day relations, if we want to build bridges to create understanding, there's no escape from the past. We do need to explain it uh, mm, in all its complications and shades. Um, yeah. Thank you. And we had a spoiler alert that Michelle's son does live in Poland. That was sort of teed up for my next question. But um, this exhibition is so much more than about the Holocaust, which we heard from Tomac and we heard from Cuba. It's about return. It's about loss. It's about celebration of traditions. It's about family. It's about intergenerational relationships. So Michelle, I wanted to ask you, you know, as this in this position of having a father who lived in Poland and having a son who lives in Poland, can you speak to the next level of the exhibit, that intergenerational connection, those traditions, this view of a homeland where both survivors have very happy, cherished memories and also very traumatic, sad memories. What is this nuance? How, what does it mean to your family? And how do you feel, besides, of course, being sad that your son is 10,000 miles away from you, but how does it feel to have that connection once again with Poland? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, one, I have to give a shout out. Adam was uh, a curator on this exhibit as well, working closely with uh, Tomek and Kuba and Monica, the other curator, while living in Poland. I also have to give a shout out to all of Adam's friends who are here. Uh, Adam was very excited. His friends were coming. Polish, I think. Most of you are Polish, I think. He's very excited you're all here. I got updates on all of you this morning. Um, uh, it's interesting. I mean, 
Um, my father went back to Poland all the time. He brought Linda, he brought Nina, he brought Jessica. That's unusual for a Holocaust survivor. Most people say to me, why are you going to Poland? Why are you doing an exhibit in Poland? How could you even step on the ground there? It's a graveyard and so forth. I don't feel that way. The first time I went to Poland as an adult was 1996, 96, with my husband and my mother to return to her hometown. She had not been to her hometown since September of 1939 when she left in the middle of the night. I had a lot of baggage with me on that trip. Um, I went in Krakow, which wasn't bombed, which is why it's this very beautiful city and there's still seven historic synagogues and so forth in the Kajmeres. There's what's called the Planty, which is on the main square around it's a ring of um, greenery. And I'm a run I was a runner and I, would r I was running it and I saw an old man with a German shepherd and I stopped me in my tracks. This is 1996. And I was like, I'm out of here. I, I just was freaking out. I was, I was completely so, and I find now when people go for the first time and that's all they see, they're just there to go to Auschwitz or to go to Belgitz and so forth. You're not really getting, you're not at all getting a picture of what's in Poland today. I've now probably 30 trips in to Poland before my, my son's been living there six years, works uh, for the Talby Foundation via Shana and um, so, but before even Adam moved to Poland, I was in Poland quite a bit. I was very involved with the JCC Krakow. I've been involved with the Galicia Jewish Museum and have a lot of friends there. Um, Non-Jewish Poles, that's my friend group. Um, they've all embraced me, they embraced my history. Um, I have a very, very different experience there now. I enjoy going, it's, it's not, I don't go to Auschwitz, I don't do the death camp tour. I do stop in Plaszow every time I'm there, it's kind of a, and they go to the Jewish cemetery just because my father's grandmother is buried in that synagogue. And that synagogue, in that cemetery. And my father was also bar mitzvahed in one of the synagogues in the Kashmir's. But it's the intergenerational response, I think, what appealed to Cuba and to Tomek, is that Adam lives there, I go back a lot, Richard went back a lot with his family, particularly with Nina and my brother David went on a tour with March of the Living. Um, and they went often. It was a big part of Richard's life, was Poland. I think he always felt Polish over feeling American. I also think that's why he never perfected his English. He had a ton of Polish friends. Um, he got involved in bringing medical equipment to Poland to help people. Um, anyone who was Polish who came to the U.S. for medical care, he helped them out tremendously. They probably stayed with Linda and Richard. I don't know. Knowing Richard, they probably did. Linda's shaking her head yes. Um, uh, we were very different. Um, there's a young woman who works at the museum, Fanny. I don't see her here right now. She's, oh, where's Fanny? Oh, there's Fanny. Fanny's mother is, uh, uh, grandmother is also a survivor, and our kids went to school together in New York. And her mom and I would talk about this, about going to Poland and the importance of it, but we're unusual that way. Most children and survivors have no interest in being in Poland, but they show them another side of Poland. When they have dinner with my friends, it makes a difference if you know someone on the ground. Because many of these trips, like March of the Living, come there and visit Auschwitz and leave, and then go to Israel. That's really the bulk of the trip, and it's unfortunate. So if you have a chance to go, to go to the Galicia Museum, go open-minded. There's definitely a horrific history, um, as there are in many places in the world. Um, it's not easy, but it's important to do, and it's an important to brace Poland in a different way. My son is actually working on a documentary now with a Mexican Jewish director about the Polish Jewish life today and historical memory and how Poles feel about the Jews that used to live in their hometown, the Jews that live there now, how March of the Living operates and how people perceive Poland that way. So it's, it's a matter of changing that dialogue and seeing it a little differently. So that's really what I would say. Thank you. And I wanted to keep this short and sweet, um, sweet home sweet, because I wanted to ensure that everyone had time to really explore these photographs, both the photographs from the jar and the photographs that follow in the decades later. I think there are over 90 photographs in the exhibition plus some testimony. And so I just wanted to thank our incredible panelists for sharing and opening and leaving us, I think, with intention and open mind and ready to receive this incredible culture and history. So thank you so much to each of you for speaking today and sharing.